Glory to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Welcome to Oraho the Way, an online outreach ministry to disseminate the love of triune God through the life and witness of the Syriac Orthodox Church. Oraho the Way is presenting a tribute to the flute of the Holy Spirit, Malfono Mor Jacob of Saruk. We are heeding the call of our patriarch, Moran Mor Ignatius Afrem II, and joining the Holy Church across the globe and with other churches with Syriac tradition and cherishing the Syriac legacy in commemorating this Jubilee year. And today we are honored to announce that we have a great speaker for this program, Reverend Father Dr. Jacob Joseph. He is an Associate Professor of Christian Mission at Holy Transfiguration College, Agora University, and a lecturer at St. Athanasius College, University of Divinity, Melbourne, and teaches courses on Orthodox Mission, Contextual Theology, Syria Christianity, Church History, and Indian Contextual Theology. 
And today, Achan will be talking about or his lecture is titled as More Jacob of Saruk, Embracing the Poor. And you will have the opportunity to interact with Achan uh, as he is through with the lecture. Without any delay, let me welcome Reverend Father Dr. Jacob Joseph. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Renjan Matthew. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Once again, thank you, Reverend Matthew Etchen, for this wonderful opportunity. It, is, it gives me immense of joy to be a part of the, the study group, particularly studying the life and contribution of Maud Jacob of Serug, the flute of the Holy Spirit. And I'm humbled myself that Urho, the way our team extended the special time for me to talk about an important area of Maud Jacob's writings and also spirituality. And therefore, first of all, I just wish to thank all the team members of Urho and especially Father Dr. Matthew. The study on the social questions in the writings of Maud Jacob of Serug is an extra demand from scholars. The theme such as social concerns or concerns to the poor seem not to be the central focus of Maud Jacob of Serug as we read the scholars of Maud Jacob. However, such themes can be found subtly in most of his writings, which has not been properly e extracted. In this presentation, an attempt is made to introduce a social lens of Mojeka by reading his love for the poor. This paper does not claim to dwell into the entire corpuses of Mo Jacob of Serug to extract the social themes that Mo Jacob had produced in its entirety. The primary emphasis of this paper, titled Mo Jacob of Serug, Embracing the Poor, is to see how Mo Jacob had treated the poor theologically and its direct response to our contemporary social fabric. The paper does not hide the dilemma before us on how to understand early church teachers and their understanding of the people labeled as the margins of the society. Or differently stated, how the early teachers treated people who fall into the category of poor, widows and socially and economically marginalized communities with their social involvement and perspectives are yet to be studied systematically. In short, this presentation will address the way more Jacob of Serug imagined the kingdom of God experience by analyzing the act of embracing the poor, considering embrace as a Christological category that connects with the poor and the needy, and how the poor perhaps shapes a new theological type that is in the image of God, and such image becomes a source for eternal life. Mo Jacob, according to D. H. Connolly, was a gentle and studious bishop of Batnan, chief city of Serug, a district which lay a little to the east of the river Euphrates and southwest Edessa was born at the village of Katam on the Euphrates in the year 451 AD. As Jacob's scholars agree upon that the early vocation of Mo Jacob was to visit the rural villages of Serug, more than the capital city of Batnan, for the episcopate, and there he might have encountered the real life of poverty and the suffering of the ordinary people. Of his numerous writings on various themes and variety of subjects, as His Holiness 
Afrim Barsum refers to it as in his book, The Scattered Pearls, a history of Syriac literature and sciences, include topics such as faith, goodness, atonement, resurrection, glory of food, praise to the Blessed Virgin Mary, prophets, apostles, and martyrs. In most of the theme, these themes, Mor Jacob develops a necessity for praxis, or probably practice, of those theology in our daily lives among the faithful. His call for the practice of what is preached, love of the poor, or love for the poor, becomes the theme for today's presentation. This theme is found in volume two of Father Paul Berjan collection of St. Jacob's homilies. The name of the homily is Love of the Poor. Sebastian Brook, the well-known Syriac scholar, translated Love of the Poor into English and the unpublished version is available for academic purposes. We will heavily depend on this version for today's presentation. When this paper changes its title from Love of the Poor to Embracing the Poor, the author imagines that the word embrace, which is in Syriac nafik, takes a Christological turn. This Christological interpretation can be seen from St. Jacob's typological approach to the Old Testament and direct understanding of New Testament texts. For example, when he deals with the question of the poor, first he places Christ, the one who is being embraced poverty voluntarily, which is reflected according to him in the Old Testament and in the New Testament books. In his homely love of the poor, Mor Jacob explicitly advocates his understanding of God in Christ and Christ's direct case identified with the poor. So what are those typological or Christological passages that we find in his writings? Some of the examples as follows. The need to bring Christ as poor is referred to in the following passages. When he writes about follow the model of the widow who gave her two pennies, Luke chapter 21-2, and when Zacchaeus, the tax collector, knew that Christ is the love of poverty began, and with which he began to love the poor, Luke chapter 19, 8. And when he says, you cannot serve two masters, meaning both God and mammon, Luke chapter 16, 13, or Matthew 6, 12. And when J more Jacob explains about the needy or the good soil, in the story of the sowing of the seed and even Luke chapter 16, 23, when he explains about Lazarus and rich man, all these explanations directs us towards Christ, the poor. And then he brings the typology from the Old Testament that the, those passages, Genesis 18, 8, where the guest at the house of Abraham and the suffering vision of Isaiah's vision on suffering, Isaiah chapter 53, verse, verses 4 and 6. And Sira, talking about giving to the poor, is giving to God. All these portions depict the direct connection to the Christological nature that Mor Jacob envisions from the Old Testament. And then the direct connections that again he makes in the New Testament models, which is he talks about the Christological references, Matthew 25, 36, when you visit one at the jail, you are visiting Christ. And more Jacob, Jacob continues, serving the poor, receiving the life, which means that life is Christ. And Matthew 8, 20, when he says, follow Christ who identified poverty, meaning you are asked to follow the poor because Christ became poor. And as Paul explains, according to more Jacob, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, God who was rich, yet he became poor. 
and Ephesians chapter 4, 32, be kind, compassionate, and forgive to imitate Christ, he means that these are all talking about the relationship between Christ and the poor. What was the primary reason for, for more Jacob to begin to write about the poor? One of the main the theories behind this attempt could be the common interest of Christian leaders shown in his time to develop the love of the poor or love for the poor. On Christian leadership and their response to poor and the rich between the years 380, 300 to 600 AD of the Roman Empire, both Byzantian and Oriental leaders were considered a virtuous act. In W. Radel and W. E. Crumb's edited and translated book on the Canons 14 of Pseudo Athenicius, the author narrates the importance of love of the poor in the late Roman Empire. According to Canon 14, a Christian bishop takes up the guardian of poor or the love lover of the poor par excellence. A bishop who loves the poor, the same is rich, and, and his city and region shall be honored. This benevolent act is expected not only from the bishop but from all people of all categories. Peter Brown's seminal work, Poverty and Leadership in the Later Roman Empire, provides us with a good scholarship in this regard. Brown, one of the very significant scholars who studied and studies in the area of the early Christianity, argues that to be a lover of the poor became public virtue in, Roman, in the Roman world. This was an was expected virtue from rich people, Christian leaders, and Roman authorities, including the emperor. Codex of Justinius agrees with this claim. In P. Kruger's edited version of Codex Justinius 1.2.12 explains as emperors, namely Valentine's third and Marcian, who ruled the west and the east of the Roman Empire in 451 declared that it is a feature of our human nature, a human rule to look after the interest of the destitute and to ensure that the poor do not go without food. The modern archaeological evidences also show us that the ancient Greek or Roman world periodically experienced utter poverty and famine where the leaders of the society urge the rich to help the poor. The best book that we can read in this regard is the scholarship from Richard Horsley. His two monographs, namely Christian Origins, A People's History of Christianity, Volume 1, and Jesus and Empire, The Kingdom of God and the New World Order, narrate the significant amount of data that brings, us, brings to us the light of how Roman world treated the poor in spite of the call for their support. This is true while we read people's social lives depicted in the Old and the New Testament. A category of people in the villages, as narrated in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, were in utter poverty for many reasons. If you turn to the beginning of the New Testament writings, one would see that Augustus Caesar, King Herod, King of Judea, began constructing cities in the Galilean provinces, recruiting laborers from the villages. An important study in this area is done by Warren Carter in his work, which is published titled Matthew and Margins, a Sociopolitical and Religious Reading. Many such studies testify the king, that King Herod followed bonded labor system. No wonder to see the increased amount of poverty in the Roman world. It means, according to Carter, that most of the crowd who followed Christ was composed of poor and the people of heavy laden, sick and weary, and so on and so forth. The passages mentioned in the love of the poor by Mord Jacob of Serug are also the best examples for understanding the life of the poor in the biblical times. 
having explained the common trends of more jacob's time to develop a love of the poor we must also ponder over whether more jacob of seru considered his love towards the poor just as a stereotype urge of the christian or state leaders of his time however his homely love of the poor clearly explains that he develops his passion towards the poor mainly because of his christological confession this conviction brings new vistas of interpretation of the poor and christ educating his audience to create a love for the poor with a sense of theological urgency in general jacob's saint jacob's christology is not understood in this way one of the pioneering and seminal works finding jacob's christology is robert c chestnut's three monophysite christologies severus of andrew philoxenus of marburg and jacob of seru in this work though it is controversial and debatable to accept the term monophysite and jacob's attachment to gnosticism chestnut alludes to jacob's christology with a different note than saint severus and more philoxenus according to chestnut jacob of seru's theory of knowledge has distinct and gnosticizing tendencies which produce a very different picture of christ he continues a quote jacob's thought is far more mythological or symbolic far closer to the thought world in which gnosticism flourished than to the world of greek philosophy and theology when producing the different images that christ held in jacob's writing chestnut limits only with the titles related to mythological system the doctrinal question of oneness of christ and mixture the image of servant the secret jesus and the image of chariot of his ezekiel in none of these themes chestnut presents jesus as poor the criticism that chestnut chestnut must face here is his less tendency to push the theme of the image of servant to bring about jacob's imagination of placing jesus within the context of poverty and the social status of marginality or people who are categorized as poor due to their social economic conditions in short chestnut chestnut's interest to explain christ in the uh, mythological approach by discussing the first and second adam is again questionable within the framework of the love of the poor because he limits this theme even within the myth- mythological approach it is in this context we need to look at how more jacob places christ in the image of the poor reading through his homely love of the poor christ as the poor the kingdom of god this is the next title i have put here christ as the poor and kingdom of god the most important image of jesus that more jacob extracted for this theme is the suffering of jesus more jacob writes jesus bore our sufferings and was smitten with our sicknesses just as isaiah wrote concerning him in isaiah 53:4 for your sake he was made a beggar in the streets in hunger and needed among along with the poor in this world to his listeners he wanted to emphasize a figure of jesus that equates the self emptying figure which identifies with the poor by quoting second corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 more jacob writes he who is rich has lowered himself to become a debtor seeing that he seeks to scatter his riches in all sorts of ways he is hidden and exalted high above all the ranks of heavenly beings but when a poor person stand stands at the door you see him which means you see christ mo jacob emphasizes and says that jesus is poor and takes a different form of poverty 
But to see Jesus poor, you need the eye of faith. He exalts, if you want to see Jesus the poor, open your luminous eyes of faith that does not doubt with the sick, with those in distress, with those who mourn, with the needy, with the hungered, the buffeted and afflicted. He is confined in prison. Go and visit him among with the prisoners, as mentioned in St. Matthew chapter 25, verse 36. He whom the cherubims convey on their backs with trembling lights, smitten on the bed of sickness, among with the sick. Every poor person is a disguised form of Christ. And that is the challenging change, a difference that we have seen in Jacob of Sarai. So according to St. More Jacob, they are just like the guests who visited Abraham, mentioned in Genesis chapter 18, verse 8, to fulfill his typological interpretation. More Jacob does not want to keep this just as a, theor a theological category or an idea of Christian interpretation of the poor. Instead, he observes this as a practical reflection of Christian faith. And therefore, for Jacob, every person who begs for bread before you seem to be the image, image of Christ. Christ is God, comes before you as a beggar. More Jacob, Jacob writes, he at whose fierce heat the seraphs of fire cover their faces is here going around in the person of the poor begging bread from you. He before whom the cherubim of fire trembles in his exalted sphere are here going around with the beggars from house to house. Jacob's this interpretation gives scope to the rich as well to enter in the kingdom of God. He advises the rich people to share their resources so that along with the poor, the rich also inherit the kingdom. The next topic is justice, sacramental bread, and the poor. Justice, sacramental bread, and the poor. When the poor knock, do not tell them the Lord will give. Those words are vain, and they bring no answer to you. Instead, give, and then you may say, the Lord provides. For the poor knows better than you that God provides. This is a liturgical uh, sentence. It is found in Great Lent, the prayer recited on Thursday, ninth hour. He uses metaphorical language for denoting both the poor and the rich here. For Saint Jacob, the poor are like the good soil, as I said in the mentioned above. To see the seed, what is the seed here for more Jacob? It is the seed of justice. Here justice is equated as Christ himself. Why does more Jacob make such a revolutionary step? He perceives that the buffeted, the hungry, and the afflicted are like fields. Do not be slow in casting your seed on this good soil by taking care of the marginalized ones. The rich are exhibiting their character of Christ and, and that character must be shown through caring for the poor in their needs. For a hungry, it will be a piece of bread, whatever the little things you do, which will exist as a good seed sown in the ground. These pieces of bread that you give to a person in need will gather in shelves of life in the land above. Your gift may be tiny when it is given, yet it will prepare for you a table of blessings along with Abraham, as it is found in Luke chapter 16, 23. So therefore, remember that in a lowly and despised guise, he has come to visit you, so that when you fill his belly, you will find the bread of life. And every helping hand, therefore, is like sharing the sacramental bread. 
more jacob interprets this sacramental mystery and love for the poor very powerfully he writes i quote he has given you his own body stretch out your hands and give him bread for he is hungry you drink his blood take up and give him to drink for he is perch parched he gave you radiance and splendor to put on from the baptismal water do not fob him of with miserable worn out clothing and what are these connections that we make between the bread and justice or justice and bread the sacramental bread this practical message cautions each of his listeners that the same christ is also depicted as god of justice so the connection between justice and sacramental bread is making more on a personified level when one fails to practically respond to the face of christ in the poor elsewhere more jacob writes it is a common duty to have mercy upon one's fellow human being if he does not have pity he will be punished by justice so what is the justice justice is christ so justice is mentioned as christ so christ and his sacramental bread are to be shared the rich having gold should know that he has been made a steward manages his possession and that is the reason why we continue in our great lent prayers wednesday morning prayer it writes and reads like this here the word justice or kinuso is used as a personified noun justice stands for christ meaning justice is christ himself this exaltation of more jacob echoes in our churches every year through our liturgical singing attaching each one of us in his audience group for him the purpose of this repeated hearing of his message will be the experience of the kingdom of god irrespective of your status rich or poor the next title is eschatological life an experience of the embrace of the poor eschatological life an experience of the embrace of the poor according to more jacob of cerro the aim of extending a hand to the poor and the needy is more with a purpose of eschatological or eternal life for him the wealth that spoils the entire human goal of eternal life creates a world of evil so he intends to bring both the rich and the poor into kingdom by sharing the world's resources with the poor both the rich and the poor entails entering into the kingdom of god because every resource that the rich hold is the resource of god he explains this idea by saying give from what is yours not that you are giving from what belongs to you for you have nothing of your own to offer him it is he who provides for you to satisfy this claim more jacob provides various biblical interpretations that widow who had in her house with two small coins until she produced them and gave the way he did not reside with her next one is simon head of the disciples only had a small net the moment he cast it away he followed the son of god the apostles did not possess anything by fish net on earth they left them behind and now they are rich and possesses the kingdom sakias the tax collector had a house filled with wealth but when christ entered to be entertained there and uh, to be entertained there he straight away divided it up there was nothing in his house that sakias did not distribute since he saw that his lord was a low was a lover of poverty he does not enter a house where he sees gold since it is it has grabbed and taken his place and he is not wanted gold has not got has got up and become master wherever it is and if someone some other master enters 
he despises and insults him you cannot serve with all your strength two masters god and mammon together one will be honored the other despised because you are not capable of repaying both equally with a single honor to more jacob of seru considering the poor and place of jesus and acting accordingly would extend the possibility of inheriting the kingdom of god or eschatological or eternal life this is why more jacob writes that in the person of poor he is requesting you so that by all sorts of means he may cause you to acquire the kingdom for the rich it is difficult to experience since they hold on the wealth but more jacob does not stop their possibilities to inherit the kingdom nonetheless the kingdom of god for the poor is surely as they manifest the face of christ it is almost like st augustine's understanding of the option for the poor as a moral obligation for those who want to spread not only justice but love or st gregory the great's reinforcement of this moral obligation stating when we attend to the needs of those in want we give them what is their theirs not ours more than performing works of mercy we are paying a debt of justice or even like the words of gustavo guterres the liberation theologian when he says god's preferential option for the poor conclusion in conclusion Mor Jacob's imagination of Christ as the poor and responding to the needs of the poor as a means of experiencing the kingdom of God and thereby the eternal life through the participation of bread of life which is a challenging depiction of christology for our times so embracing the poor is a christological act and a category Christ stands for embracing the poverty of the whole world by which according to say more jacob on the one hand christ himself identifies with the poor and extends his hands to uplift the poor of the world to be able to enjoy the eternal life in today's context poverty brokenness weariness weariness and bondedness prevail in all human life fields namely religious cultural economic ecological gender etc here more jacob's voice is still not only really a prophetic theory a practice known for our daily life perhaps as more jacob imagines christ as the poor embracing the poor let us identify ourselves with those who imagined christ in the poor category of today's life along with their slogan like christ as dalit christ is black christ is minju may god help us to understand and experience the embracing nature of poor so that we will experience a christ- christological category of more jacob's teaching to be able to serve the poor and make this world a better place thank you thank you hn for this wonderful presentation um well uh it's none and you know you try to emphasize it's not just the love of poor it's the care for the poor uh so the praxis side of the uh the the understanding is what actually matters and even with that you know th- there is still hope even the rich can enter the kingdom of god and in you know, all through the um the bosoms of um great land um saint jacob is calling out the rich and what they need to do at the time of uh, great land uh to enter the kingdom of god so many times we think that orthodox is just focusing on the doxa side the worship side but you know saint jacob is reminding us it's not just the doxa it's not just the worship it is the praxis uh is actually you know what matters or maybe i would say an intersection of the orthodoxa and orthopraxis is what matters uh, in the contemporary world would you like to reflect upon that i mean you know it's a summary of your presentation as well 
Thank you, uh, Father Matthew, for uh, concising my talk. Uh, I think one of the things that fascinates me with uh, regard to reading more uh, Jacob of Serug is to see how, particularly this homely, homely of love, the poor, is that how uh, the entire discussion of the poor and the needy and the weary is taken into the into the uh, into the category of theology and Christology. So most of the time, uh, when you look at uh, the whole idea of uh, Christological interpretation, on the one hand, we lose the eminence of of its nature, or how do we look at Christology in our our day to day life? And sometimes we also see the the opposite side of it. We we overemphasize eminence, but we don't take care of what is happening with the transcendent. And uh, more, uh, Jacob of Serug uh, is very fairly uh, and very uh, carefully uh, creating a, a system of theology whereby he brings this uh, to understanding of not only uh, the idea of the praxis, but also the confessing the faith. And not only the confessing the faith, but also the idea of praxis. And therefore, he went at, uh, even uh, at the extent of saying, Jesus is poor. Now, it is a very challenge, though this is a very simple sentence for us, uh, but it is a very challenging sentence for our times when we continue to interpret the same, the nature of poor into our day-to-day -day category of human life, as, I, con as I, I concluded in my talk, that in the uh, black American context, people say Jesus is black. And uh, we know that in the Asian context, people say Jesus is Minjong. Uh, or in the Indian context, even uh, there were theologians, there are theologians, they would say Christ is Dalit. And sometimes when we hear this statement, we are a little bit uh, reluctant to accept their theology, but we are very happy to accept more Jacob's interpretation of Jesus as poor. So taking that poor as a category and understanding uh, the theology uh, behind it, particularly in the view of uh, Christ as the poor, it is he is not only identified in the New Testamental text, but bringing those... Uh, Typological arguments starting from the very Moses's topics or, or texts uh, where uh, he starts from Genesis, where how uh, how the uh, Abraham experienced his visitors and how he handled the people or those who came to them to him were poor and the needy and treated them as a God category, and all the way from there until. Uh, his, Jesus' own words, bringing uh, his nature of interacting with the poor. And probably this is where, again, some of those statements that we are not happy to listen to, uh, if, I, if I quote again um, Guterres, that God's preferential option for the poor, is being there the solid theme, even, to, even while we read our fathers. But uh, unfortunately, when we uh, extract the theology from our early fathers, we are more uh, fascinated to look at uh, the transcendental side of their interpretation uh, and not much with, uh, uh, with the day-to-day with the -day, uh, experiences that, that are connected within their, their writings. And I believe that is my major criticism to Chestnut where he has very uh, readily brought out the concept of the servant of God, Jesus as the servant of God. But with, uh, if, if you read that book, Three Monophysite Christologies, uh, where you will see that only one sentence, he, he refers to this statement uh, that Jesus is referred to as uh, the, the, uh, the servant of Christ or the servant, but immediately, he falls into the same category of interpretation of a mythology, where he brings the Adam, first Adam, 
and the second arrow. It, I mean, it is absolutely uh, right. It is absolutely good. And that is the strong part of our theology. But at the same time, we must also push ourselves to see how these categories are connected to the servanthood of Christ. And that becomes a, a very uh, uh, or an important, important aspect uh, of, of type of understanding of Christ in our today's context, where uh, the imminence of Christ is, is, uh, is an important uh, 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 discussional point. I think this, this is where I believe, uh, for me, more Jacob of Sarugas giving much hope uh, to, uh, uh, to us in today's world, along with the solid uh, Christological uh, method and even typos that is presented in his all other uh, uh, confessions. And I think that that's what I wanted to uh, convey uh, in, in, into this uh, particular presentation. Right. Um, so Jacob of Saruk never uh, looks at the incarnation event as a historical event. It's it's an ongoing event. So, uh, yeah. so that yeah. incarnation, that uh, embracing Christ, embrace everyone. That's that's how uh, he was embracing uh, men. He was embracing every every creation. So that's how he, he you know we also need to embrace um, each other and you know embrace uh, not just the poor but the entire creation may be uh, in a wider perspective as well. And this incarnation even has to continue in its fullness. Uh, so this is how Jacob of Saruk uh, views uh, this historical things. So many times, you know, we just go back and view that and study that as literature or study uh, many things or the, the whole corpus of um, the, the, the patristic literature uh, as uh, you know, uh, just look at that without any 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 contextual uh, taking any any contextual reading uh, with the eyes of, or you know looking uh, or reading the uh, you know the fathers through the lens of our own experiences, our own context, and they developed this divine um, theology or reflections on the scripture based on the context, based on their life experiences. Even St. Jacob, you know, he, he, you know, he was born at the time, I think in the same year, the, Cal, the, the uh, I mean, you know, so there, there are a lot of heresies and many, many things are reflecting as response to the ongoing heresies. And, you know, so Jacob of Sarug is giving a lot of hope for us, uh, especially, Achen, you are, um, you know, you are more into the contextual, um, side of theology and, you know, the mission and practical aspects of theology. And, you know, without that, what we are doing is going to be uh, a sterile exercise. And, you know, um, so we are not growing or, you know, we are not transforming. We are not becoming human in Jacob's own words. And thank you so much uh, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, so, if you have any other final thoughts, um, just please reflect and then conclude with a benediction. Uh, thank you, Achan, for those concluding uh, or, uh, remarks. Uh, my prayer is, uh, is that we must take our, our early teachers, church fathers and mothers, very seriously. And in uh, today's context, I think it is very much needed uh, for our practical life. Uh, and I think it demands more uh, vigorous reading, rigorous interpretation, and, and going deep into their own uh, confessions, uh, not just to keep only a category of a geography, just it, it is important. It is important to, to, to acknowledge and also to cherish our past and our, our entire uh, world of our desert fathers or church fathers or uh, anti nicene or post nicene fathers and their contributions. And that's what we are today. But at the same time, we need to, to take them into, uh, into our own lives and context. 
if I put it more in a methodological manner, I think I have I've explained it elsewhere and even in my writings, I've, I've, made, I've made it clear uh, that we had a tendency, even in the modern orthodox theologies or theological writers, um, uh, had a tendency to just cut and paste our church fathers, you know, just go back to the 6th century, 4th century and get a quote and then, you know, use it for today, rather than allowing them to speak for us today. So that is more important. And that's the reason why I hope you remember that in my previous lecture in the same forum, I said, fathers, fathers, are, not dead. fathers are not dead. And that's my, my, my creed, my, my dictum, fathers are not dead. Their voices can be heard even today. But the, the most important thing, thing is that you need a voice, a, a, a practical voice to be heard and for which you, you should become a father or a mother today and allow them to, uh, uh, to make a polyphonic approach uh, to the world so that they will speak uh, on the context. Definitely, they will allow us to understand what is in their mind without losing their doctrinal position. And so that's the most important. They, the foundation, the fundamental fact is the doctrinal position that you can't change. But that doctrinal position would allow us to think further and go beyond and, and see today's context. Because contexts are changing, ever-changing uh, contexts and where you need voices and you need support from our church fathers and mothers. And that is the most important thing that we need to take up today. And I think as I, I conclude, I would also... Uh, uh, borrow the words of uh, uh, Bishop Callisto Spare uh, very recently when he was making uh, a critique on uh, the methodological uh, approach of George Florowski on uh, the neopetistic synthesis. Uh, he was making a statement that we have been uh, uh, taking up our early fathers and mothers on more on the uh, level of praising our history but now we must also know why they wrote those, uh, their literatures for the humans existing today. So, or maybe the, the, the world existing today. And therefore he makes a very controversial statement that now it is the time for us to change from, change our categories from top to bottom and look at human beings and look at the creation where you need to really understand what is the meaning of creation? I think that makes a very solid uh, uh, step uh, for Orthodox theologians to contribute in today's world. And I think I, I strongly believe uh, Bishop uh, Baer is giving a very good direction to us that God speaks to us. And even during this Christmas season or time of uh, uh, Advent, and we are going to celebrate uh, the birth of Christ uh, next week, I think we must really understand why did God become, uh, uh, you know, come to this earth and become a human being, and what is the the need for that, and what is the what is more relevant for us to understand the world that God said, I, I mean, it is after every creation He said it is good, or John chapter three verse sixteen He says God so loved the world, and what is that world? And when we when we understand that God so loved the world. We must also understand even more Jacob of Serov in the same, uh, I think in, uh, in another homely, Tamar, I believe, uh, he says uh, the world is evil. So he, he, he makes a category between the evil of the world and the world that God has seen good. You know, So this is something very important for us to continue to grapple with. And I think uh, the, particularly the Orthodox theologians must uh, dwell into or get into this pool of understanding of our fathers and fathers are not dead take them very seriously and allow them to speak today that is my my uh, final word for this group uh, who, are, who are listening to to me today and thank you so much all my listeners and all those who are loving uh, the uh, the way and thank you father dr Brenton matthew for having given me this opportunity though i'm a part of this whole process of encouraging this talk to everyone but uh, this space is more i believe that a blessed space through which we are uh, disseminating as you said at the beginning disseminating uh, god's uh, word uh, through the eyes and lens of our early fathers and orthodoxy and uh, i I'm, I'm i'm thankful to you all of all of you and also do pray for me as well 
Uh, thank you so much, Achin. Um, uh, thank you, all viewers, uh, all, all those who are listening. Um, and Achin, uh, please conclude with the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one, now and forever. Amen. Thank you thank once you. again, um, all viewers. Thank you, um, Achin. Thank you. God bless everyone. All glory to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.